doing the series on There is Sin to Death. And uh, our text verse that we use for the series is 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. The scripture says, If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin not to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not to death. There is sin to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not to death. And so we have um, been looking various aspects, um, at various aspects of this particular teaching uh, with regards to sin uh, to death and sin not to death. And we saw in the previous teaching, we had a look at the erroneous teaching that uh, is taught to many part, in many parts of the church that once saved is always saved. And I think they call it eternal security as well. That's one of the terms given to that particular teaching. And we saw that that is contrary to the Bible, that the Bible doesn't teach us that at all. And uh, we had a look at uh, 1 Corinthians where the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul taught us how the Lord in fact does judge his church. And one of the, well, the, the main reason that he judges his church is so that they may not be condemned with the world. Um, 1 Corinthians 11.32 and so we said that uh, if it was impossible for Christians to lose their salvation well then our Lord Jesus was unjust in judging his church uh, so that they wouldn't be condemned with the world because it would in fact be impossible for any uh, Christian to be condemned with the world and so our Lord got it wrong and obviously the Lord didn't get it wrong and then we saw that um, we looked at the scriptures that uh, people who teach this particular doctrine, or what's the word, this error, um, we saw that uh, they like to use the scripture of Romans chapter 8, 38 and to 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then also John 10, 28 and 29. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And so we said that uh, it is quite correct to say that no one can take us out of the Father's hand because no one can. There's no one strong enough to do that. It's also quite correct to say that no one can separate us from the love of God because again there's no one there's no, nothing strong enough to do that but we did say that uh, the person that is left out of that passage of scripture or those lists spoken about is the individual themselves because each individual member of the body of Christ when we come into the kingdom of God our free will remains intact and so as an act of our free will God does allow believers to walk away from him. So it's not a case of God is a dictator and once you come into the kingdom of God, well that's it, he takes away your free will. That's never the case. Um, and so we looked at various other aspects of, of scripture along that line. We saw with regards to our Lord Jesus Christ in when he wrote to the church at Laodicea, uh, he said to them, he said, so then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, that's Revelation chapter 3 verse 16, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And so we said that uh, when the Lord spews um, individuals out of his mouth, well, then they are no longer part of the body of Christ. And so very clearly, uh, the scripture is um, pretty plain in a, a number of scriptures. And we went through it in, in quite extensive detail that the scripture is very plain about the fact that Christians certainly can lose their salvation, that there is no such thing taught to the, uh, to the believers eternal security, that it's impossible for one to lose their salvation because the Bible teaches us completely contrary to that. And so today we want to look at two other aspects with regards to this teaching of uh, the sin to death because we're really concentrating on that particular sin. <clears throat> Because we identified right at the outset of this teaching that all sin is not to death. Um, there is only the one sin which is to death, and that is in fact the sin of denying Christ. And so um, we've had a look at that particular sin, and we saw that it, as I say, is the only sin that uh, an individual can commit that will then kill the born-again spirit. 
And so in this teaching today, there's two aspects we want to look at. We want to look at uh, what paths um, a Christian needs to walk on in order for them to reach the point where they will commit the sin to death. Because as we said right at the outset of this teaching, well, through this teaching basically, that um, the path is sin that we walk on in order to commit the sin to death. But it's only once we get to the end of the path that we then commit the, uh, the sin to death. And so um, all sin is not the sin to death. There is only one sin, which is the sin to death, which is the sin that John was speaking about. And so we need to understand how is it possible that Christians can actually commit the sin to death, that they can reach the point in their walk um, away from the Lord where they are quite prepared to deny Jesus Christ as their Lord and no longer choose to follow after Him. Um, and so the first way we're going to look at is the fact that the one path that uh, the Christian can walk on that will lead them to the sin to death because at the end of all of these paths that we will investigate now and uh, go through over today's teaching and the next one they all lead away from Christ and they all converge on the one point which is the sin to death so although there are a couple of paths there's more than one path that a believer can walk along in order to reach that point of committing the sin to death um, Nevertheless, it is not only one path that leads away from Christ to the sin to death. There, are, there is more than one. But the one path that we want to look at right now is the path of continuing in sin. And so, it is, sin is not going to kill the born-again believer. Sin doesn't have that effect on the born-again believer. In fact, it has no effect on the spirit of the born-again believer. Uh, they may remain spiritually alive. Uh, throughout their sinful practices that they are practicing. Uh, if they were to die in sin, the Bible teaches us very plainly that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that is why our Lord Jesus very often does judge uh, His saints with early death if He sees that they are in a, uh, a lifestyle of practicing sin because He doesn't want them to go all the way down the, the road and, and then commit the sin to death. So even though they might die while living in sin, because they have not yet committed the sin to death, their spirits remain alive. And so to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so it is sin that is allowed to reach maturity in the life of the believer that it will eventually bring forth spiritual death in that believer. So it's not a case of you commit sin, well now you're going to die spiritually. Not at all. It's if we allow sin to grow and take a hold of us and become mature. Once that sin becomes mature, um, it will bring forth death in the life of the believer. And uh, James puts it across very plainly for us, the Apostle James, in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Um, and if you look at James's letter in James chapter 1 verses 2, he addresses his letter to the brethren. And so this letter is addressed to Christians. This letter is not addressed to unbelievers. And he says, um, verse 14, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death and so this is talking about Christians who are tempted and drawn away by their own desires now the desires that he's referring to here are the desires of the flesh uh, because uh, Paul teaches us very plainly that um, we if we walk in the spirit we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh and the flesh and the and the spirit lust against each other they are contrary to each other and so he encourages believers to walk in the spirit and not walk in the flesh. And so the desires that um, James is referring to in this passage in verse 14, uh, when he says, are drawn away, so they're, they're drawn away, what does that mean? They're with Christ and the fleshly desires draw them away, draw them away from Christ, draw them away from walking in fellowship with Christ, and now they get drawn down the wrong path. And so they they get drawn away by their own desires and enticed. And so it's their fleshly desires that entice them 
to go down this path. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then he says, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So whatever the desire might be, uh, when uh, an, a, a Christian uh, gives into that desire, and the way they give into it is they actually do it, whatever that desire is. Um, when they do that, they then give birth to sin. So now they've just committed a sin. Now that sin does not kill the born-again spirit. That, that Christian remains spiritually alive. And the next sin they commit does not kill the born-again spirit. That spirit remains spiritually alive. And still absent from the body, body is to be present with the Lord. But as they continue in sin, and as they continue to go down that road, uh, James says, well, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle James says, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So sin has to be given time to grow, to become fully mature in that Christian's life. Now, when sin grows and becomes full grown uh, in that Christian's life, it brings forth death. And the death he's speaking about is spiritual death. And the reason that it brings forth death is because they then commit the sin to death that the Apostle John spoke about. And so, um, it is not sin that brings forth death. It is a full-grown sin that brings forth death in the life of the believer. So you say, well, how do we know when they reach the full, that when sin reach, reaches full and grown state? When, well, when they commit the sin to death, that's when it's reached uh, its full grown state because that's when it brings forth death and they commit the sin to death. So, you know, it's a very simple uh, formula. As, as Christians continue in sin, well, that's the, the ultimate result is it will eventually bring forth death. It will grow and grow and grow in that believer's life. And they'll harvest uh, their, their, what they've sown. And what they've sown is death and what, that's what they will reap. Let's have a look at another scripture. Uh, we've looked at this in the previous uh, teaching dealing with uh, this, the subject on the error of uh, once saved, always saved. But this particular uh, scripture also just hi highlights this particular truth for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Because we're here concentrating on the fact that Christians can commit sin. And that has no impact on their eternal salvation. And Christians can commit sin however many times that they want to. And it still does not impact on their eternal salvation. It is when sin is full grown in the Christian's life, that is when it impacts on the eternal salvation because that is when they will then commit the sin to death. And so we're looking at this path that Christians can go down and it's a, a path of sin. It's a case of saying, um, you know, so what, what, you know, a little bit of sin is not going to hurt anyone. Well, it doesn't hurt anyone at that time, but it's... Um, Paul says it, he said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And he says it more than once. And our Lord also spoke along those lines as well. In fact, he used the same metaphor, that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And uh, so, you know, when, when, when seed is sown, it's in a very small state. But if that seed is nurtured and watered, it will grow into a huge tree. And when that tree is uh, fully grown, it will produce the fruit of that tree. And that is what... Uh, sin produces. The fruit of sin is death. It, that's the ultimate result of sin. It's, it's death. Sin never ends on sin. And that's why sin can only be dealt with by the blood of the Lamb. That's the only way it can be dealt with. Um, Christ has to apply his blood to the sin in order for that sin to be uh, taken out of the Christian's life. But if the sin is left alone and the sin is nurtured and the sin is watered, it will grow it will become a, a tree and that tree will produce fruit and the fruit of sin is death. That's the only fruit that the tree of sin can produce in anybody's life and uh, obviously in the Christian's life. So the Christian, uh, the, the, the text we're looking at is 1 Corinthians chapter 5 beginning in verse 1 through to verse 6. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, 
and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And so in context, Paul, when he says a little leaven leavens the whole lump, he's talking about the church environment. And he's saying that to the church in Corinth, you need to be pulling that uh, believer out of your environment because he will impact uh, on the church. And a little leaven in that church will leaven the whole lump, talking about the church. But as that analogy is used for the church, so that analogy is also used for the individual because Paul recognizes very clearly that unless they deal with this Christian sinful practices, um, he will eventually reach the point where his spirit will no longer be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, the only way that that Christian can get there is to get to the point where they commit the sin to death. And so Paul's intervention is let's rather... Uh, give him over to Satan so that he, he can die physically, so that he can go to be with the Lord, so that his spirit may still be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so the, when, what James referred to as sin being full grown, bringing forth death, uh, Paul refers to as the leaven leavening the whole lump, and thus bringing forth death. And so that is why Paul wanted to make that intervention in that particular Christian's life. Um, before he reached that point. Now, many Christians um, abuse the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. They say it is all right to commit sin uh, because we're under grace and we're not under law. Um, and we are under grace and we aren't under law, but grace was never intended uh, by God for us to be able to abuse it. And uh, Peter talks about the fact that um, we're not to use grace uh, as a cloak for vice. And that's in 1 Peter 2.16. He talks about the fact that God did not intend for us, because we, we Christians do need grace, because if we were under law, the moment that we committed sin, our spirits would die, because uh, that's, that's the result of uh, sin under law. There is no grace there. But because Christians are under grace and not under law, when Christians commit sin, their spirits don't get affected. And so Christians get deceived into thinking, well, because my spirit remains spiritually alive to God, even after I commit sin, because I'm under grace and not under law, I'm, I'm safe. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing that can change that. And if they adhere to the, the, the false teaching that says we have eternal security, well, then they definitely are deceived all the way down to the point where they will then commit the sin to death. But our Lord Jesus Christ taught the truth in 8, John 8, 34, the Gospel of John. He's, he said that he who commits sin becomes the slave of sin. And so that's one of the, the aspects of committing sin, is that sin, sin then enslaves the believer, because it now has a hold on that believer's life. And it becomes that much easier for this, the believer to commit sin again. Um, because that's the nature of sin. It enslaves the one uh, who practices it. And so our Lord Jesus said that uh, sin, uh, he who commits sin becomes a slave of sin. And he's talking about believers when he said that. Um, the Apostle Paul, in speaking uh, to the church on this issue, in Romans chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, he says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? Now look at this. Whether of sin leading to where, Paul? To death. Or of obedience leading to righteousness. And so the Apostle Paul teaching us, well the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul teaches us, he, he uses the same language as our Lord Jesus, for our Lord said, he who commits sin becomes the slave of sin. And here the Holy Spirit is saying that if you uh, present yourselves slaves 
Um, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin. So if you uh, obey sin, you become the slave of sin. That's exactly what our Lord said would happen. The Holy Spirit says the same thing. But uh, the Holy Spirit explains it further, for he says, whether of sin leading to death. And so when a Christian uh, gives themselves over to committing sin, they become enslaved by that sin. And what that, that, that uh, sin does as the master, because uh, sin becomes the master, the, the Christian becomes the slave, uh, is that master leads the Christian to death. And that is the sin to death, which is at the end of the road. And so it's very plain that Christians who continue in sin will eventually commit the sin to death. That's the path they're on. And uh, as I say, if you nurture that uh, seed and you water it, how do you do that? Continue in sin. If you continue to water that seed, that seed produces the tree. And that tree, when it's fully grown, will produce the fruit. And the fruit of that tree is spiritual death. And the other, the analogy that uh, the Holy Spirit uses in the book of Romans is that he says, you guys become Christians who, um, how, do you, how does he put it here? Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, slaves to obey? So Christians who present themselves to sin and obey sin in their lives, they become enslaved by that sin. Sin becomes their master. And he says, sin leads to death. And he's talking about spiritual death. Because this, uh, again, in the book of Romans, uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to Christians. He's not talking to unbelievers in that passage of Scripture, which is why he says, Shall we continue in sin now that we are under grace? He says, no, you can't do that. Um, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death? So Christians, you can be, become enslaved by sin, by presenting yourself to sin. When you present yourself to sin, sin becomes your master, and you become enslaved by sin. And that, that master will lead you down the road to the point of, of death, spiritual death. Um, he, he talks about it very plainly in that passage of Scripture. Let's have a look at another passage of Scripture that talks about this concept. So we, we, we're talking about the paths, the various paths that Christians can walk down that will lead them away from Christ and that will lead them to the point where they will commit the sin to death, which is to deny Christ. So while they're on that path, they still remain a child of God all the time. No matter how many sins they commit, no matter how grievous sins they do commit, they still remain a child of God. And at any time while they're on that path, uh, God can intervene and can arrest them and let them see the error of their way and they can turn, repent and receive forgiveness and are restored straight away. They're taken off of that path and back on the path of righteousness straight away. And they're back in fellowship but as long as they're on that path of sin uh, they are going in one direction they're going away from Christ and they're heading towards the sin to death that is the, the path that we're dealing with um, and it, so it's a very dangerous path to be on because it's it's the grace of God that allows other believers to see this Christian walking down that path and to pray for them because we said in I think the previous teaching that a lot of Christians because what you see what happens with Christians that uh, become involved in sin is they tend to withdraw from uh, the church uh, because they don't want to hear uh, the word of God preached because they come under conviction. And so, you know, they, they tend to isolate themselves from the church. And in doing so, um, they no longer, no longer have the support network of prayer around them because... Uh, out of sight, out of mind. And so Christians don't pray for them anymore because they don't see them that often anymore. And so they become more and more vulnerable uh, to be led off to the point where they will commit the sin to death. Anyway, so here's another scripture, Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. Scripture says, Therefore, brethren, talking to Christians, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Why, Paul? For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
So he's talking about uh, spiritual death here. He's not talking about physical death. He's not saying that if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live for all eternity. You will live and you will become immortal. Or even Christians who by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body still die physically. Everybody dies physically. There's only two people on the earth, well, they're in heaven today, who have not tasted death physically. Elijah and Enoch are the only two. Everybody else has tasted death physically. And everybody else will still taste death physically physically because it is appointed for men once to die and after that the judgment and so we all die physically there's no one who is immortal we will receive our, our resurrected bodies when our Lord returns and then we will become immortal as he now is immortal but at this point in time we dwell within mortal bodies and so our, our bodies are subject to death and so when he says Christian if you live according to the flesh, you will die. He's saying you will die spiritually if you live according to the flesh. Now the flesh that he's talking about is sin because in the book of Romans in, in uh, chapter 7 and 6, he talks about the body of the sins of the flesh. And so he, he teaches us that these bodies are contaminated by sin. And so um, the flesh that we dwell in is sinful in nature. And so he, in, in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, I think it is, you know, Galatians 5, 19 uh, to 21, he, he lists the works of the flesh, and they're all sinful. He talks about adultery, he talks about murders, fornication. All of those works of the flesh are, in fact, works of sin. And so when he says here, yeah, Christian, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die, he's saying, Christian, if you continue in sin, you will die. Um, spiritually because you know, not, he's not saying if you, can, if you live according to the flesh you're going to die physically but if you don't live according to the flesh you're going to stay alive for the rest of eternity no, we, he's not talk, talking about physical death there at all he's talking about spiritual death and so that's why he says we're debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh so again very clearly the scripture tells us guys if we're going to live in sin the end result of it is spiritual death. That's what it will produce every single time. Um, and so it's, sin is not to be taken lightly. It's not to be played around with. Because, as I say, if you, if you sow the seed and you nurture that seed, it will produce. And the fruit, fruit of that seed is death, spiritual death, in the life of the Christian. Because we said right at the outset of this teaching, this is not talking about unbelievers at all, because all unbelievers are already spiritually dead. They don't die again spiritually. They're on their way to hell. Christians are on their way to heaven. But if they die spiritually, then their destination changes. They no longer go to heaven. They then become destined for hell, just like all the unbelievers are. Let's have a look at another scripture along this line. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Beware, brethren. So again, he is writing to Christians, this, the writer of Hebrews. It's the Holy Spirit writing through uh, this particular apostle. He says, beware, brethren. So he's warning us. When, when, when the Holy Spirit says, beware, and he talks to Christians, beware, brethren, he's talking about believers. We need to be warned on this issue. Why? Lest there be in any of you, Christians, an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the, the deceitfulness of sin. And so he talks about Christians, he warns Christians that we need to um, make sure that there's not in any of us an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. To depart from the living God means to walk away from Christ. It doesn't mean to fellowship with Christ. To depart from the living God means to turn away from God and have nothing more to do with God. That's what an evil heart of unbelief does. It departs from the living God. Um, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you Christians be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so sin is deceitful. The reason it's deceitful is because when, we, when the Christian commits sin, um, there's no penalty incurred from the point of view of spiritual death is incurred straight away. 
They remain sons and daughters of God. And so their viewpoint is, well, there's no penalty. And so sin becomes deceitful because you know, it's only a little bit of sin. It's only a, a white lie I'm telling. And then that white lie grows into something else. And then, well, I'm only doing that. And that grows into something else. Well, I'm only doing that. And that grows into something else. And eventually, all the time, what is happening? Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so it, it's a gradual process that takes place on, or, or, or in the Christian's life. They gradually become more and more hardened to the things of God. And um, sin becomes more and more accepted and acceptable in their, their life uh, because they no longer can see that what they're doing is sinful. You know, I'm under grace, so you know, stop judging me. Um, and that's the, the viewpoint. And they go down. And besides... I can't lose my salvation. Um, once I give my heart to the Lord, that's it. I, I've, I have eternal security. My pastor has taught me that. And so that's the road they go down. Um, and they become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful in this area. Uh, what did, what did um, the devil say to Eve? Was she not deceived? Because she was. The devil said to Eve, if you sin, because he didn't use the word sin, but that's well, we, we're putting it out there as he actually said, he said it. If you sin, you're not going to die. That, that was deceit. Because God had said, Eve, if you sin, you will die. We didn't understand what the sin was. And we, we write uh, uh, in, I've, I've taught on this point before, the definition of sin is being disobedient to God. Simple as that. That's the, the simple definition of sin. And so God had given both Adam and Eve a commandment, don't eat of that fruit of that tree. Um, and so and Satan comes along and he deceives Eve. He says, no, you won't die. Um, you can eat the tree, uh, fruit of the tree and you won't die. So that's the deceit of sin because sin says, no, you can, you can you know, partake of sin and you're not going to die. But that's not true because she partook, she believed that. She partook of the fruit and she died spiritually. And instantly, the moment she partook of that fruit, she died. And she was deceived. She honestly thought she wouldn't die. And that's where a lot of Christians are. In, they, they, they partake of sin and they honestly believe the lie from Satan. Sin won't kill you um, because you have eternal security and you can never lose your salvation. And so they believe that just like Eve did. And they continue in sin, and it's a, a, a deceitful, it's a lie from Satan. It's his deception, and uh, it hardens them until they get to the point where they are quite prepared to commit that. So remember we asked at the outset of, the, out of, of this teaching this afternoon that how is it possible that Christians can get to the point, Christians can get to the point where they are quite prepared to deny Christ and to no longer have anything to do with him. It's because they have been deceived by sin and they become hardened by sin. And they're quite prepared. By the time they reach the end of the road, they are ripe to commit that sin. And uh, the sin is full grown and it's about to produce death in their lives. And again, as I say, they believe the lie all the way down. We, as, 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 as Satan deceived Eve, Adam wasn't deceived. Eh? Adam knew he was going to die. But he, he, he was quite prepared to take that um, penalty because he wanted to uh, become like God in that area. Eve was deceived, and that's where a lot of Christians uh, get, get taken in. The, and, and weaker Christians get taken in. They get deceived. They get that, that lie from Satan. Sin won't kill you, so don't worry about it. You're under grace. And that's not true. Sin will kill the born-again believer when it's fully grown. Let's have a look at another scripture. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Remember, uh, James says, when sin is full grown, it produces death. It brings forth death. Verse 8, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Again, in the book of Galatians, Galatians 6, 1, he writes this letter to the church. He's talking to believers here. He's talking to Christians. When he says, do not be deceived, Christian, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, 
Whatever any Christian sows, that he will also reap. For he, Christian, who sows to his flesh, will of his flesh reap corruption. That word corruption means destruction. And it is the opposite of, the, of sowing to the Spirit, because he who sows to the Spirit will reap, of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And so it's the opposite of everlasting life. What is the opposite of everlasting life? Eternal death. And that's the, what they will reap. He says, he who sows to his flesh will of his flesh reap destruction, eternal death. That is, he'll commit the sin to death. And he says God's not marked in this area. And so it doesn't happen overnight because when you sow seed in the ground, it doesn't produce fruit the next day. It takes time for that seed to grow into a full mature tree and then produce fruit. But when that fruit is produced, that fruit is spiritual death. And so is this, and God is not mocked in this area. And Christians tend to think they can mock God in this area. They tend to think that sin is quite acceptable in the kingdom of God because it has no impact on me. And in fact, it doesn't, as we said, from the point of view of the born-again believer who remains spiritually alive. But what it does do is it continues to lead the Christian down the, the path of sin to the end when they will commit the sin to death. And let's have a look at another scripture. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 21. Scripture says, For when they speak uh, great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if, they have, if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. And so in this passage of scripture, there's two categories of uh, believers. And that the first category are those who have already fallen away from our following after Christ. Um, these are the ones who speak great swelling words of emptiness. And they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who actually escaped. It says, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. Um, for by whom a person is overcome, by him he is also brought into bondage. There they have become enslaved by sin, and they uh, are slaves of corruption. They have died spiritually. I'm talking about the ones who speak the great big swelling word, words of emptiness. And so, you know, that they, they, they promise believers... Don't get caught up in sin. You, you're under grace. And there's no such thing as um, sin anymore. Sin has no impact in your life. Um, and, but in the meantime, those particular people who are proclaiming that to Christians are in fact themselves spiritually dead, for they have since fallen away from Christ. And now they are deceiving uh, fellow believers who have, are looking at them and listening to them and saying, but wait a minute, we have escaped it. And so these guys are saying to them, no, it's all right, you, sin is fine. Under the kingdom, you're under grace. You're, you're not under law. So don't get hung up about sin. Um, don't let these people try and put you under law and bring you into bondage and condemnation and judgment. Uh, you're not, none of that's for you. You're, you're at, at liberty. Um, you're in freedom. You're in Christ. You can do what you like. All things are lawful for you. In fact, that's true. All things are lawful for us. But... And I wouldn't get down to that side of it today, but the reason that all things are lawful is so that the spirit of the born-again believer remains alive even when they commit sin. But what the, uh, these individuals um, do not tell those who are listening to them is that there is an end result for your lifestyle of sin. And so what happens is that these people get brought into bondage again. He talks about uh, for by whom a person is overcome, by him he is also brought into bondage. And so Jesus said it, he who commits sin becomes a slave of sin. And so they, be, they get brought into bondage of sin once again. Um, and so they've escaped the pollution of the world. Now these are the baby Christians who get led astray by this, these uh, false teachers that are out there. And so they've already escaped, they've become born again believers, and they have the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But they listen to this kind of teaching, 
and they once again become entangled in sin and they become overcome by sin again and um, the latter end for them is worse than the beginning because we said that the one who commits the sin to death will receive a far greater judgment on their day of judgment than even unbelievers will because unbelievers have not accepted Christ and then trampled his blood underfoot these ones have they've accepted their, their forgiveness of sins they were born again and they have since committed the sin to death trampling the blood of Christ underfoot and so that's again there's that as I said the two categories there's those who've already are fallen away and then they entice others to follow after them telling them now nah, you're under grace everything's fine uh, there's no condemnation and they like to quote that scripture there's now there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus and they stop even though the scripture carries on says um, there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who do not walk after the flesh but after the spirit and so they don't put that in they don't they said that's a condition there's no conditions we shouldn't meet any condition yes there is the condition is is that we walk worthy of this walk calling with which we have been called and God is not mocked in this area and so definitely uh, the path um, to reaching the point of committing the sin to death which is denying Christ one of those paths that leads the Christian away from Christ to committing uh, the sin to death is the path of sin and so if a Christian chooses to walk down that path um, eventually that is what that is the outcome as I, as I say unless two things take place unless the mercy of God is able to uh, get them to repent of this sin and come back into fellowship with the Lord and no longer walk down that path or the mercy of God kicks in and he judges them with early death and he takes them home to be with him before they reach the end of the road but for the rest uh, there's no there's no prayer uh, going up for those individuals they will walk down that road of sin uh, enslaved by sin and they will reach the end of the road and they will then commit the sin to death and so that's one of the paths that leads to the final destination of sin to death here's another path that um, leads Christians away from Christ uh, to the, the point of committing the sin to death and that is the path of no longer enduring sound doctrine uh, this is another path that Christians can go down scripture we can start with is uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 beginning at verse 1 through to verse 4 I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom preach the word be ready in season and out of season convince rebuke exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables and so this is another uh, path that Christians can go down to reaching the point of committing the sin to death is that they can start they can turn away the ears from hearing the truth and turn aside to listening after fables the fables is um, just uh, uh, fictitious stories that are made up of uh, uh, spiritual things that are untrue by and large um, and so and, and Paul calls it idle, idle babbling. So it's just people just swelling off stuff that they don't know what they're talking about. But it sounds all super spiritual. It sounds all good, but it's not sound doctrine. And so um, the church, uh, the the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul warns the church about believers who turn away from the truth and begin to follow after those who will no longer teach sound doctrine. And so this is another dangerous path for Christians to, to walk down. Now, Paul was addressing the issue in his day, uh, because we look at this passage of Scripture in verse 3, he says, For the time will come when they, when they will not, not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have each in years they will heap up for themselves teachers. And so we think, okay, well, that's the end times. But Paul was addressing the issue in his day. It was happening in his day. That's why he admonishes Timothy that um, 
he needs to preach the word and to convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Because Paul recognized that there was coming a time when people would, would no longer endure sound doctrine and they would want to go after uh, all of these fables. And you have uh, the church has been inundated with fables uh, at this present time. These coming from all different uh, viewpoints. You know, that um, there's this other aspect to Christianity and there's this other aspect to Christianity. Um, and all of it is fables, none of it is sound doctrine. And so Christians get drawn aside and get drawn down this particular path as well. And uh, Paul, again, writing to the churches in Galatia, he says in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1 through to 4, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. And so the churches in Galatia had started to contemplate converting to Judaism because it was quite a, a, a strong influence in Paul's day that he had to contend with in the church in that he had the Jews who would go into the churches and proclaim that unless you guys uh, observe the law of Moses, unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. Uh, you, you can believe in Christ, that they didn't deny that, but they said you have to be able to do all of this. In fact, you have to convert to, Ju to Judaism and then you really will be saved. And so Paul says to the churches in Galatia, he says, you guys, if you go down that road, then you have become estranged from Christ. To become estranged from Christ is to be removed from Christ. You have fallen from grace. And to, be, to fall from grace means they're no longer under grace. They're now under law. And to be under law means that uh, they, their spirits die. It's because they had now um, accepted another religion because Gentile, um, Gentiles were not Jews before they came into the kingdom. They were Gentiles. And so for a Christian, a Gentile Christian, to then become a Jew, to take on Judaism. Well, he has now denied Christianity and he's now gone into Judaism, which is another religion. It's not the, the gospel. It's not, it's not the, the, um, the faith of Christ. And so they become estranged from Christ and they um, have fallen from grace. Now, it, that, it, Paul had the problem with Judaism in his day. But, uh, you know, there are so many different religions out there today. Um, and people, Christians, get drawn aside. And they, they, they start thinking, well, maybe Mormonism does have something to it. Maybe the Jehovah's Witnesses do have something to them. Um, maybe Islam has something to it. And so they start to explore this and they start to um, uh, look at taking this on and adding it to the Christian faith. And eventually they go down this path and they get to the path where they deny Christ because now they've now found the true way. And it's Judaism or it's Islam or it is uh, Mormonism or whatever other. There's so many different religions out there. And so Christians do and can uh, follow down that path away from Christ. And uh, it's again, it's a deceitful path because... Uh, the ones who preach these different uh, doctrines and from the different cults and, and obviously different religions, some of it sounds you know all good and spiritual, but in fact it's not. It's deceptive because it lead, leads the Christian away from Christ. And anything that uh, dictates to the Christian that there's more to salvation than just Jesus Christ, um, you know, then you have to then the red flag should go up straight away because there's nothing else. Everything is in Christ. And so you have, again, in, in the church today, you have a strong Jewish influence. You have, um, because there are uh, a, a, a lot more Jews that have come to faith in Christ, but the vast majority are obviously not. But what Satan has done is that he's brought in these, um, they call themselves um, Messianic rabbis. And there's no such title in, in the New Testament, um, but they give themselves the title. A messianic rabbi and because they have uh, Jewish credentials remember Paul said guys you know if these guys have got credentials 
I've, I've got credentials that, that matches them and exceeds them. But he says, it means nothing. And, but a, a lot of Christians get taken in by this. Well, this is a Jewish rabbi, so he, he knows Hebrew. And so he should be able to really give me greater insight into my Messiah. No, not at all. Jesus is your, it dwells within you. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. And you're born again of God. You don't need a Jewish rabbi to give you greater insight. You just need the Bible and, and the Holy Spirit and fellowship with fellow believers. Um, but they get taken in by these, and a lot of them, not, there's one or two that must probably, uh, no, there's not, there's not. <laughs> Anybody who proclaims himself to be a, a Messianic rabbi is not, uh, it's not the Lord's teaching, not at all, it's not the Bible. And so they, they you know, they, they sound their chauffeurs and whatever they call that thing, and they put their uh, shawls on and they, they sound all Jewish, and so a lot of Christians get taken in by this, and they think, well, this must be something, and they, they think they've got to add something else to their Christian belief, and they get taken down this road, and it's a road that's going to lead them away from Christ. And so that's why Paul says, guys, don't go down that road. He says to the churches of Galatia, um, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not become entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And the yoke of bondage that he's talking about to the churches in Galatia is that a lot of Christians then want to now start observing uh, Jewish uh, laws and start observing uh, Jewish feasts. And they say, okay, they're not Jewish feasts, they're the Lord's feasts. And yes, they are, but they're not Christian feasts. Those are not feasts that are given to the church. Uh, those are feasts that are given to the Jews under the Old Covenant. Now the Jews under the Old Covenant still have their covenant in place. God has not removed their covenant. And they are meant to observe those feasts. And Christian Jews, uh, I know that Jewish believers have a problem calling themselves Christians, I, uh, I suppose because of the connotation of the Crusades. and all, I don't know. Well, anyway, um, But Christian Jews, when we're talking about born-again Jews, um, it is right for them to observe the feasts and uh, to observe um, the Sabbaths and things like it, because God has called them as Jews to witness to their brothers and sisters um, in, in, in Judaism, but not yet in Christ, so that they can win them to Christ. But Gentiles, that's not our calling. God has called us as Gentiles. And so for Gentile believers to, to think, well, we can start observing the Feast of Tabernacles and all of these different Jewish um, um, laws, it, it's wrong. It takes the Christian away from their liberty in Christ. And they become entangled in the yoke of bondage. And eventually, and I've seen, they, they, they become Jews. They convert to Judaism. And they think, okay, well, we've really now found the way. Because it's a path. It's a deceptive path. It takes the Christian down that path as well. So, and so... You get also, within the Christian church, you get those, the, the cults that teach unless you are baptized in water, you cannot be saved. You can accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, yes, but you still have to be baptized in water. Until you're baptized in water, you cannot be saved. And the Bible doesn't teach us that. Baptism in water is very important and, must, and it should be partaken of in this life. But it does not impact on the Christian salvation. And so anything that would be added to the Christian faith or in Christ for salvation is not of God and so it should be avoided at all costs by the believer but as I say Christians get deceived in this area and they walk down this road it's another scripture 2 Timothy 2 verses 15 to 18 be diligent to present yourself approved to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth but shun profane and idle babblings for they will increase to more ungodliness and their message will spread like cancer. Hermonius and Philatus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. And so what happens, you get these people that come into the church, and in this case, Hermonius and Philatus are born again believers, and they were teaching this uh, false doctrine in the church, that the resurrection is already past. And what they did, as Paul says here, is that they overthrew the faith of some. What does that mean? It means that those Christians that they, they preached to said, what's the point? I, I've given my heart to Christ, but the resurrection, I've missed it. The resurrection has a repast, so what's the point of me carrying on? And so they walked away from Christ. They overthrew their faith. 
And so here you have born-again believers teaching false doctrine that causes Christians to walk away from Christ because they hear that these false doctrines and they think, well, you know, what's, there is no point to Christianity then. And so they, they turn away from Christ. And he says their message spreads like cancer. And so that's what cancer does. Cancer spreads. And so, you know, within the, the, the body of Christ, the cancer spreads, but with it in the individual as well. So if the cancer it takes root in the individual, the Christian life, the cancer spreads and it will eventually produce spiritual death in that believer's life because they believe the lie and because they've turned away from sound doctrine and they are now listening to uh, all weird doctrines and uh, they fall away from following after Christ. So in that case there, Paul said that those individuals had overthrown the faith of some, so those believers had fallen away. Here's another scripture, Titus, chapter 1, verse 7 through to 11. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convict those who contradict, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Paul had a problem with the, the Jewish guys in his day. Verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. For the sake of dishonest gain, always um, um, false teachings that are coming to the church, it's for money. It's always there's, there's a, a money motive behind there. But anyway, what had happened here is in this case is that these individuals had gotten hold of a whole household and subverted them. What does that mean? They, the whole household had converted to Judaism and followed after the, these guys' teachings. And Paul said they must be stopped. Their mouths must be stopped. We have to put an end to this kind of thing because it does impact on believers' lives. And so it is very possible for this uh, aspect, for this path to affect the believer as well. And so it's, so it's so important for Christians not only to stay away from sin, but to remain in sound doctrine and not to be drawn aside by doctrine that is not sound and, and following after things that is not scriptural New Testament. Um, because if they do, a little leaven leavens the whole lump in that area as well. Um, and so going down that path will take the Christian away from Christ and eventually they too will reach the end and that end road, end of that path is exactly the same sin, the sin to death because they will convert to whichever uh, religion they have become enticed by and once they do that they have fallen from grace and they have become estranged from Christ as Paul taught the churches in Galatia and so those are the, there are more paths, we'll in the, last, the next teaching we'll deal with it and we should finish the series um, but those are two paths that Christians can walk down which will take them away from Christ and take them towards the sin to death. Um, and so as Christians, we, we must stay away from those paths and we must stay on the path of righteousness and the path of sound doctrine. Very important for Christians to stay right there. But we need the teaching on that particular point.